evening, wherever you are located on this crazy planet of ours. I'd like to welcome you to webinar 16. And my name is Susan Aronson. I am with the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub at GW. And before we get started, I just want to say happy holidays to everybody. <laughs> and um, so give you a little bit of explanation regarding this webinar, which is the webinar was based on an idea by one of the speakers, Patrick LeBlanc, who had written a, an op-ed which looked at whether or not the WTO is really the right place or there's some sort of new venue that the world could create to govern data flows as well as various types of data. And I regret to say that Patrick had some medical problems, so he could not join us today. And so today we, we were lucky to get Darren Smith, who directs services at Global Affairs Canada. And so today we're gonna to have four different perspectives on this issue of whether the WTO is the only or the best place to govern data flows. So we're pleased to welcome Lee Tuthill of the WTO, Darren Smith, who directs the Services Trade Policy Division at Global Affairs Canada. And he was the lead negotiator for the USMCA, also known as the HUSMA, um, formerly NAFTA 2.0, as I call it. Um, and then we have Professor Christina Arion, who is a professor of law at the University of Amsterdam. She's in the Institute of Information Law. And we have, we're pleased to welcome Rachel Stelly, Stelly who um, is Trade Policy Counsel at the Computer and Communications Industry Association, um, which um, advocates for digital trade and works with a wide variety of tech firms that, go, that work on, with data. So thank you all for being here. And uh, we're gonna begin with this question. How did the WTO become the leading international venue to govern cross-border data flows? Rachel, do you wanna start? Sure, I can start. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. First, I just wanna say thank you to Susan for organizing this panel. It's certainly a busy time of year. So I appreciate all the work of Susan and her team on setting this up. And as a brief way of introduction, um, CCIA is an international industry association which represents a wide spectrum of internet and of the technology ecosystem. And our members include everything from internet services, e-commerce sites, hardware providers, and telecommunic telecommunications companies, all who export services and goods throughout the world. So I've been tasked with, the over with um, giving a brief overview of how we got here regarding data governance in the WTO. Um, traditionally, as many of you know, global trade order focused primarily on goods in the post-war era, not necessarily services because services weren't as easily tradable. Before agreements such as the GATS, there was relatively little thinking about trade and data. And now cross-border trade and services are huge, especially in the US economy. And data flows underlie a lot of this. For example, um, estimates by the Bureau of uh, Economic Analysis at the Department of Commerce estimates that in 2018, U.S. exports of ICT goods and services was 148 billion and 80 billion, respectively. Um, and in addition, exports of potentially potentially digitally enabled services were 499 billion, comprising over half of U.S. export service exports. And so, for the sake of for sake of time, um, I wanted to use this time just to give a brief overview of the main mechanisms that CCI members and honestly. Uh, wide variety of data intensive global businesses rely on to operate globally. First, we have longstanding international trade rules on non-discriminatory treatment. Um, the WTO GATS agreement contains obligations on non-discrimination and transparency. And these rules have been in place before data intensive industries have become such a large part of global trade. And to note that these rules may also play a larger role with regards to digital governance broadly as countries discuss a variety of regulatory proposals that go on, go beyond data flows, as some are clearly targeted to a handful of certain companies. 
In addition, we have, um, of course, the bilateral and regional agreements on data that govern data flows. And this can include, include both one, trade agreements with clear text on data flows and data localization, such as those included in CPTPP, USMCA, and recently RCEP. But there's also these regional frameworks and best practices, such as the APEC cross-border cross -border privacy rule system and practices and guidance issued by the OECD, as well as the G20. And these best practices have in turn been referenced in FTAs, such as the USMCA, as appropriate frameworks to satisfy FTA commitments on data flows. And then this last book is data transfer mechanisms, such as the EU, US privacy shield that allow for interoperability of privacy regimes. Privacy, for example, is a key legal mechanism which allowed thousands of companies to use transfer uh, to transfer commercial data from the EU to the United States. So that said, we've seen a number of threats regarding these tools that companies usually rely on to transfer data. Um, regional and multilateral trade agreements have different approaches on data flows and data and um, data localization language. The EU has proposed something quite different um, in terms of what they're looking at in FTAs. Um, RCEP has which was recently agreed upon has some quite broad national security exceptions with respect to the data localization language. And then of course you have USMCA, which had a much more liberal um, uh, approach to data flows. And of course, the EU also struck down the privacy shield in 2020. So companies are a little in a little bit of a, a limbo trying to figure out what's the next step there. And so generally all these tensions um, new and ones that have been going on for a number of years have been the background that have led to support for the WTO to undertake work on e-commerce broadly, trying to find some baseline agreement on key issues, including data flows and data localization, um, including a number of other uh, digital trade facilitation measures on a global multilateral level. And this has been referred to as the Joint Statement Initiative on e-commerce or JSI. And those, that work has been going on with a number of WTO members. Uh, CCIA has strongly encouraged members involved at the JSA to, uh, process to use this opportunity to find some type of long lasting clear rules regarding data flows. And we remain encouraged by the process and the work that has been achieved so far. I'm sure others on the panel can talk more about that. And so uh, to conclude, um, CCI views the WTO's role in data governance as an important convening role to reach agreement on a multilateral basis on key digital trade issues. While it's just certainly one aspect of a larger intricate, intricate governing framework of the global digital economy. Um, we continue to support the efforts and continued enforcement of existing trade obligations at the WTO to provide internet and to provide certainty for internet and internet enabled exports. So with that, I will pause and turn it over to other panelists. Darren, um, could you give us a sense of how Canada views uh, the role of the WTO in governing cross-border data flows? Uh, certainly. Uh, and first, let me also uh, thank you, Susan, for the invite to today's uh, discussion. Uh, and also appreciate uh, Rachel's um, uh, intervention, uh, providing, I think, a really good foundation uh, for the discussion on this particular question. Uh, I think for Canada, you know, we look at the WTO as, you know, one of the um, leading uh, venues to discuss this issue, not to say that there aren't other opportunities to discuss uh, a wide range of digital trade related matters, including specifically governance issues in other fora, but the WTO does have, as Rachel's pointed out, um, uh, a history in terms of dealing with some of these issues. And also uh, um, it provides a venue for us to take what we've learned in a regional or bilateral context back to the WTO. That's always been part of our I think, a uh, circle of activity that, you know, the WTO influences, of course, what we do from a negotiating perspective uh, with our regional and bilateral uh, part trading partners. But at the same time, it also allows us uh, an opportunity to take the, the harvest, what we've done in those contexts and bring it back to the WTO to see if we can create um, a broader understanding um, amongst, uh, I'm obviously a much larger group of uh, participants. That doesn't come without its challenges, of course. You know, when you're dealing with now um, a membership that's uh, well over 160 countries, some of which in this particular domain don't have a lot of experience in terms of discussing these issues in a, in a trade-related context, uh, there are some issues. But I think that's what also makes the WTO um, a very um, solid uh, prospect for us in terms of advancing this issue. 
uh, because of its history of adopting to new issues, you know, uh, starting from its origins, you know, WTO has shown itself uh, growing out of the, out of the gap to its current uh, formation, the ability to take on new issues, including more recently, I think the ability to address uh, a blend of issues that are considered trade or, and non-trade. Uh, what used to separate these issues in the past used to be a lot more concrete and now it's a little bit more fuzzy. Uh, but nonetheless, we think we have the opportunity to, uh, to address this uh, constructively um, yeah, in Geneva. You know, there used to be a time where uh, people would say that discussing intellectual property at the, at the WTO was not correct, or dealing with issues like gender or labor or environment uh, were outside the scope of the WTO. So this debate is always going to occur, and you know, we'll have to figure out exactly what is on, in our swimming lane and what's not. But I think a couple of additional advantages that we have to take a look at is that uh, the WTO has a culture uh, of, uh, of achievement. Uh, some people will take issue with what I've said, but it's true. Uh, although things sometimes move at a glacial pace, uh, in the course of human history, 5, 10, 15 years is but a blip in, in, that, uh, in that spectrum. Uh, we do achieve results. Uh, secondly, I think we have to take a look at the fact that, uh, and I'm looking directly at Lee here, we also have a very professional, competent secretariat. Uh, that uh, plays a key role in our work. And that's, uh, that element has to be taken into account when we look at bringing a broad group of countries together. Uh, the secretary performs um, a very important function for our ability to actually move the yardsticks forward. And that's not always present in, uh, in some of these other formations. Uh, the development component, uh, that's ingrained in our work as well. We have uh, the capacity to, with the WTO secretariat, uh, with entities like uh, the WTO Center for Advisory Center for Law and the WTO Law, ACWL, uh, the International Trade Center, to actually undertake a lot of technical assistance capacity building activity, which is obviously crucial in this realm. Um, and that's also missing in, uh, in other contexts. So uh, you have the history uh, in terms of delving with these in, in, in these issues and going back to the original GATS, of course, even some in Canada's context, some of our original trade FTAs. Uh, a long running uh, work program in this area. And now we're evolving, trying to be more responsive, I think, to um, the expectations of not only business, but also consumers. And it's not gonna be without its challenges. Uh, we're, we're now uh, realizing, you know, just how much difference does exist amongst WTO membership in terms of the approach on these issues. But it's not an excuse not to do something. I think it's actually an excuse to actually do something and to create a dialogue that tries to find out where the synergies do exist. And we're gonna find ourselves, including within the JSI ECOM context, uh, with, with some very significant differences that'll be difficult to overcome. And it's gonna incur, it's gonna necessitate a lot of creative thinking to tackle uh, some of these issues. We're still gonna be struggling, I think, moving forward uh, in terms of some of the broader questions, in terms of what's gonna be the exact architecture of its, its scope. How are we gonna tackle a potential market access dimension? What is gonna be exactly the approach we take uh, with respect to um, special and differential treatment for developing economies? We have some really tough questions ahead of ourselves. You know, some of it will be addressed at the technical level. Uh, some of it's gonna to have to be, uh, uh, require uh, political, uh, injection of political uh, perspective. Uh, and so where this initiative will go, we'll have to see. I'm hoping that's gonna be a successful initiative. Uh, I've been part of many unsuccessful initiatives. I was our lead TISA negotiator. I cut my teeth on the FTAA. Uh, I've seen it go uh, down before. Uh, but at the same time, we always seem to pick ourselves up and find new ways to actually continue to move the yardsticks forward. You know, in fact, a lot of the work we're doing right now in the JSI ECOM was born out of, I think, previous discussions that weren't successful, uh, including the TISA. We've been able to continue to, I think, um, you know, find ways to uh, engage on these issues. And that's certainly the expectation of industry. Uh, it's the expectation, I think, of a lot of consumer uh, groups as well. And um, there's certainly, I think, uh, gonna be a uh, healthy debate in terms of exactly what are gonna be the parameters of this initiative. And that's what we uh, wanna see. And I'll put a plug in for the fact that uh, Canada is also a co-sponsor of a transparency initiative, uh, along with New Zealand and Ukraine. Uh, to actually have the full release of the consolidated texts that can be put out there for experts such as yourselves to actually provide the actual feedback that we need uh, in this process. So uh, if there's any, I know there's a number of non-Canadian participants on this, uh, on this call, so feel free to knock on the door of your local trade negotiator and ask him to or her to uh, give this uh, strong consideration. The WTO has a history of being transparent in 
in these areas and we need to kind of revitalize that. So uh, we're strong supporters of that. We, we put all our proposals on our own website, but until you actually see the full document, it's kind of hard to actually assess it uh, properly. So uh, transparency will be a, a key part of this too. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, this will uh, be the uh, one of the results, early results we have in, in 2021. Anyways, I'll maybe stop right there and uh, look forward to uh, uh, further back and forth and questions on this, uh, on this matter. Thank you, Darren. And you made two key points that I'd really like to stress, not only transparency is essential to building trust, but the role of Lee Tothill at the WTO Secretariat um, in, in finding consensus and guiding issues, um, history will mark that as very important. So let's hear from our two other speakers. Lee, did you wanna say anything right now? Sure, I, I'm, and I had a couple of comments. Um, I, I'm not sure the WTO leads because I, I really, it's very many years I've been working with the IT and computer community and the telecom community for many years when WTO was stymied from doing anything. I saw a lot of interesting things happening amongst telecom regulators and, and the ITU, for example. But it's, it, the digital economy is such a complex ecosystem and there's many actors, all of whom have an important to role, role to play. Um, and then, you know, I see, you know, subject specific activity going on that's extremely important in the area of, of, of cross-border collaboration on cybersecurity, cybercrime, uh, consumer protection even. So each of these is extremely important and part of the ecosystem. What may make the WTO a little bit different is when it does accomplish something, it tries to have binding rules then it has a functioning, hopefully functioning dispute settlement system that is widely regarded as being very good. Um, that might be one of the key differences that uh, makes governments accountable to some of the rules we do come up with, but it most definitely has a role in trade and that, that's its mandate. And, and specifically, if, if JSI had never existed, we would really be de de dealing with data flows issues through the GATS primarily. I mean, I think we recognized back uh, during the early 90s when we were negotiating it that almost all services are information intensive, had a telecom annex written because the fact that they would need to, to transmit their services and many times through telecommunications. Um, so, you know, we, we had transparency and every of other group I've seen working on various aspects of data transmission has stressed transparency and uh, the non-discrimination as well. Fortunately, other groups are working on that. Normally, and I've said for years, WTO would not interfere with the activities of other groups unless they run up against, uh, you know, uh, practices or create practices that are inconsistent with things like transparency and non-discrimination. So there is an unavoidable overlap with trade rules, especially because the GATS, the GATS is so deep, right? And we've already had cases on, on things that are online, like the Antigua gambling case and the you know, cases on networked financial services and downloadable music. I mean, we, the pre, prior to the JSI existing, we already had our panels forced to deal with what happens when data flow through networks and systems. Um, so I think that it's, it is an important role, but it's not the only actor. And um, I think that it will probably, hopefully, as a result of work like the JSI, collaborate more extensively with some of these other actors. We're not gonna write consumer protection rules. I mean, not at any level of detail. We're not going to tell people how to do, you know, cybersecurity or cybercrime. So we can set certain standards that because of our trade role, but I think we'll have broad repercussions to some of the other communities who, who are very much involved in, in internet governance and data governance. Thank you for that reassuring thought. Um, before I go directly to Professor Irian, 
um, who's going to talk about why might, it might be problematic to have these discussions at the WTO. I want to remind our audience that we are nothing without your, you and your questions. So if you don't mind putting them in the Q&A, um, we'll try to get as many of them answered as possible, starting in about 15 to 20 minutes. Professor Irian, could you add your thoughts about why is this problematic? Thank you, Susan. Thanks uh, to everybody setting the scene. And you already hear it's a lot about economic interests. Yeah? Um, I am uh, an assistant professor at the Institute for Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. And I'm very much engaged with the governance of uh, transnational um, technologies. And in a way, we are talking right now about our internet, one of the greatest achievements of our information civilization. And it also is an infrastructure and a space uh, that connects economic interests with many other interests, interests of individuals, of communities, of societies, of uh, groups in inside societies. It is much bigger than just an economic interest. And I would also like to recall in this context that uh, we have made like decade long effort in multi stakeholder Internet governance. This has been a massive effort uh, that involved many different organizations from civil society as well, also businesses, governments and so on and so on. Uh, but however, and unfortunately, it did never lead to any binding uh, uh, commitments or outcomes. And this may also be one, yeah, one of the reasons why this is the case. Uh, maybe that the uh, the yeah, unregulated flow of information has been rather beneficial, and could uh, for quite some time continue without uh, that there has been much government intervention. Uh, this has benefited, of course, especially those nations where the largest uh, service providers, internet service providers and digital platforms are established, and that is in that case the US. And uh, it has created also uh, some of the issues we are grappling with today, an unprecedented concentration of power, uh, the exploitation of data privacy, but especially also uh, it creates an enormous risk of regulatory and normative arbitrage between societies. And this is something, even though the WTO does not regulate consumer protection or data privacy and leaves this space to the regulatory autonomy of the member states, it is something that uh, our regulatory institutions that we have at the moment uh, are not fit to tackle because you can hardly uh, enforce and uh, guarantee fundamental rights, uh, societal values, and the safety of democratic institutions, our free elections, when you have uh, an un totally uh, fully interconnected environment without institutions that are able to actually leverage appropriate regulatory interventions where that is necessary. So I'm just uh, highlighting that our regulatory formations are outdated, they are overstretched, and just leaving this space inside economic agreements to member states may actually not bring us towards a bright future where, our, yeah, where we forge an international information civilization, but also protect our societies and democracies in an adequate way. So thank you. And again, just want to remind you to put questions in the question and answer box. So Lee, can you talk a little bit about where you're at at the uh, JSI? Uh, well, I'm, I'm sure that Darren is probably even more qualified to do that just from the point of view of the secretariat. Uh, we've, we had uh, the last meetings of the year very recently. They a lot of progress. Uh, there's a new text out. It's still restricted because there's a lot of work to be done on it. Uh, specifically on data, and, and Darren can correct me if I'm true, that's a, a tough issue that I think is awaiting next year to be tackled in, in, in a more consistent way. Although all of these issues have small groups talking behind the scenes. Um, I'm impressed that they've made as much progress that they have. And I think they're 
closer than they may feel they are. I'm optimistic, but then maybe I'm, I'm always an optimistic person. But I think Darren might have a few words to say about this. Darren, please. Sure. Um, so I, I have to admit, I've also been uh, impressed with how much work has been achieved, especially within the last year. Uh, when I attended some of the meetings back in 2019, uh, we were still in the process of trying to basically uh, have everyone table their proposals and uh, and try to get a sense of you know what is exactly the parameters of a potential agreement. And a lot of questions were being asked in terms of you know what this means or what that means, and there's a lot of you know kind of sensitization of I guess the different approaches in, in a very macro sense to what that were being put on the table. And I think constructively over the course of 2020, uh, particularly through a lot of small group interactions. Uh, there's been an effort to try to have a, a consolidated text that tries to limit, uh, or at least I guess, because it's like maybe consolidates a better word, a variety of different uh, approaches or, or um, positions on a variety of different issues that are at play. So we can work from a singular document and allow, I think, uh, each of the respective uh, parties to go back to their domestic experts and validate how their domestic regime matches up against some of these ideas. And what are some of the other things that we have to examine more closely going forward? I think Lee's correct. You know, we've we've put aside, I wouldn't say put aside the right word, but we were obviously concentrating a lot on some of the issues that where there's more um, synergy between the, the parties and uh, and uh, and you know building on that, you know, that'll lead to hopefully uh, the uh, an elevation of trust and and a comfort in terms of uh, identifying opportunities uh, to create or uh, identify. You know, common ground, uh, especially when we get to some of the tougher issues moving forward. Um, so it's been a good year. Uh, next year, I think, will be an interesting test in terms of you know, uh, the ability of, of the various members to start to uh, uh, advance some of this early work and, and, and creative thinking into tougher issues. As I said, you know, we're going to have to tackle some big issues. Um, there are big differences on things like data localization. There are big differences in terms of approaches on uh, developing country issues. There's big differences in terms of the market access dimension, in terms of how that might roll into uh, our work, how, how narrow or broad that could be. Uh, and not to mention, you know, the interrelationship between this potential agreement and other WTO agreements, whether it be the Trade Facilitation Agreement, uh, SBS, TBT, um, a lot of big issues that have to be tackled. Um, and so, uh, good year, making progress, but uh, uh, there's still a lot of the mountain left to climb. Rachel and Christina, do you want to add anything to this question or, uh, about making progress? Christina, do you want to start? Yes, I follow this also eagerly. Uh, and uh, as a researcher, it is not that easy to, for example, have access to the consolidated uh, text or the bracketed version. I also approached via different organizations. It's, I don't have much to work with apart from this few proposals that are actually public from the outset, like the EU proposal in Canada, of course, uh, but I have, for example, no uh, proposal from the US, which would be important to actually understand, although we can make sense of it uh, somewhat. That is one point. The other point that I would like to bring in, I'm not sure that is clear to uh, all the, uh, yeah, the uh, societies involved and also the people who are concerned, but we are actually already with this uh, trade related aspects of electronic commerce starting to regulate aspects of artificial intelligence. For example, the data that the artificial intelligence needs to be trained, but also the predictive outcomes of AIs, which are in the end essentially data yeah, that is that can be delivered across borders. Uh, so they have a transnational reach, these AI systems. And by uh, putting that in the yeah, language of this uh, uh, um, electronic commerce agreement. It says nowhere that uh, it is already uh, treating digital services that also can be AI powered. 
And we in our societies, especially in Europe, we are at the moment still crafting our governance approach to artificial intelligence. We are at the very beginning. It's almost never a week that goes by that there is some headlines how one AI system has gone rogue again on uh, important rights like non-discrimination, racial biases, and so on and so on. So at the moment when actually regulatory space is needed to first learn, understand and develop and see what this technology will bring as benefits, but also as potential risks for our societies. We are already starting to hammer in uh, certain uh, regulations that are already restricting the scope of maneuver that uh, societies will have or members uh, will have in the future to regulate uh, um, cross-border AI supply. This is just one example. I want to make it as concrete as possible so that we actually see what the dimensions are. This merits a large discussion, a much broader discussion, and of course, a democratic discourse that deserves the name. Thank you, Christina. Hey, Rachel, um, can I ask you to talk about how this will be linked to domestic regulations? On one hand, we don't know what exactly is going on, but could you talk a little bit about the relationship between competition policies and trade? Sure, um, and this isn't just you know related to competition. I know AI had been mentioned as well. Um, I think they're all well taken points. We do see a number of countries that are looking to really revise their regulatory frameworks in light of the digital economy. We're seeing this, you know, of course, with the European Union, but also a number of markets around the world. Um, and a number of them are focused around the same things like AI competition, uh, content moderation as well. And I think that there's role um, for both trade and multilateral discussions and multilateral cooperation. Um, for example, with AI, the OECD um, released principles um, in 2019 on um, baseline rules, which we encouraged and we think it's very helpful to reach agreement um, on the basic principles that help guide national regulation. Um, I think that where trade can come in as um, and part of these discussions is kind of um, two parts. Of course, um, we had mentioned already the GATS rules on non-discrimination. Um, so when, when these regulata regulations are proposed um, in a way that um, really speaks to uh, specific harms rather than addressing certain companies, we think that that's um, a good example of um, trying to update regulatory frameworks. Um, and then also just, Another note regarding trade, um, a lot of trade agreements have rules, um, commitments on good regulatory practices. And so a lot of these good regulatory practices that apply across industry um, in terms of transparency, opportunity for stakeholder involvement, all of not targeting specific companies, that all of that is are all tools that can play into the regulatory discussions um, across different venues. So I think, that speaks to not only competition, but a number of um, uh, digital regulations that we're seeing in the space. So um, we have a bunch of questions and for which we're really grateful. I've asked the, the speakers <laughs> to, um, to address one more question, uh, which is uh, focusing on, are there other ways or better ways to govern cross-border data flows, given that many uh, cross-border data flows are not directly affiliated as a with a transaction. And I note the news yesterday that Canada is going to, or is thinking about negotiating DEPA. So I wonder if, uh, Darren, you could begin the comments. Sure, thanks, uh, Susan. So uh, again, from a trade negotiations perspective, I think Canada is uh, very open-minded in terms of you know, what are the options available uh, to us to tackle some of these issues uh, with our various trading partners. So as you alluded to um, earlier this week, we announced our interest uh, to commence exploratory discussions with the three uh, countries that are part of the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement. That's uh, New Zealand, Singapore, and uh, Chile. Uh, this agreement was uh, signed uh, over the summer and uh, will enter into force uh, in the early new year. Um, and so we've uh, indicated uh, to those parties that we wish to begin a, uh, a process to look at Canada's potential accession to this agreement. 
And the reason why we're doing so is because although it has a foundation uh, from the CPTPP, it also has gone beyond that and is starting to look at issues uh, that uh, we think are worthwhile uh, to, to, um, uh, to uh, capture within the context of an agreement uh, that build on cooperation and uh, an examination of where we can uh, inject additional certainty and predictability uh, for our stakeholders who operate in this realm and can be an incubator for ideas that can be obviously taken to uh, other fora. We certainly see this as being um, uh, complementary to work that's happening multilaterally and will certainly also influence what we do in the context of our FTAs. So the way I've described it is that, you know, we're taking uh, basically, if you look at uh, things from, uh, from a triangle, uh, one corner of our triangle is the work that we're doing in the WTO. Another corner is what we've accomplished in our digital trade chapters and other associated chapters in our FTAs. And then this third chapter, our third corner of this triangle is effectively a standalone instrument on, 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 on digital. And it gives us an, an opportunity to, I think, explore um, the possibilities of, of uh, other issues that really also touch upon uh, uh, matters of the inclusive trade uh, agenda, something that I think we can work very closely with, uh, with uh, those particular countries that are part of DEPA. Uh, some of the concerns that uh, Christina mentioned in, in her previous intervention, these are all valid issues and we recognize that we're in new territory. Uh, some of these issues will uh, be addressed, but perhaps not successfully concluded in the WTO context. Maybe this is an opportunity where we can actually uh, move the yardsticks in, in a way forward um, in, in, a, in a smaller group. It, it all depends. The idea, though, again, is that um, we're in uh, the deeper provides us, as I think, as, a, as I've alluded to, an opportunity to kind of do more in this space. Uh, to be more responsive, I think, to our uh, interests of our of our stakeholders, and also doing something that continues to build off of you know our domestic uh, framework. We're a middle power country. We have a, perhaps a bit of a different perspective on some of these issues than the U.S. or the EU, and certainly China. So, you know, working with other like-minded countries who are in a kind of a similar position to us is, is a way where we can um, inform our our our, um, our domestic perspective on these issues but also uh, work with others that uh, uh, where we can take some of our interests that transcend into the international uh, platform. So uh, we we'll hope to commence this work uh, early next year and, uh, and we'll see what 2021 provides uh, in this context. Thank you for that. Christina, would you like to add anything? I have a very quick reaction because I already talked a lot. Uh, I, as much as I really uh, support the rule-based international trade law system, I also think that uh, many of uh, the headaches that are right now, like with data localization and so on, can be solved with the existing non-discrimination disciplines. Uh, I think also uh, there, there, there could be some sort of thinking put inside what trade law already can accomplish because the classical trade law disciplines have really had some charm to them and they tackle, they don't try to regulate the internet, but they actually tackle certain um, yeah, trade restrictive practices. What we are risking right now by going into a, a digital trade chapter or into electronic commerce that uh, with a free data flow provision is that uh, we are actually creating a ways to broad and untargeted approach to data flows. Data flows uh, are in itself not traded. It's also uh, in the in the in the in the description of this panel already. Uh, it does not always concern services or products. Actually, data flows can, uh, if if uh, if they become a new trade law discipline, also um, enable the trade in data as a way that uh, that may actually also be. Uh, difficult for societies to be actually an active part of uh, the information economy because it allows the extraction of data. In fact, uh, we see in a number of countries serious thinking going on whether in addition to data flows and yes, an open internet, we also need much more efforts in workable um, mechanisms how to create the sharing of data, unleashing data from the 
from from stakeholders from actors that uh, tend to treat it as an exclusive resource how we can make data work for society how we can make sure that the data of a society also contributes to the welfare of a society so data governance data ordering data sharing will be in as much as important as data flows and uh, it is a certainly is a bit dangerous to only extract this one uh, trade law attractive aspect and, and inject it into the WTO. Uh, I actually believe that we need a, a different forum. We need a, a forum that is not only more inclusive, but also treats data more holistically as a multi-dimensional concept that also recognizes the different properties of data. And uh, I know that, uh, for example, Susan is doing some really valuable work on that right now. We need to think uh, of data uh, in, in different ways than just uh, seeing any restriction to the flow of data immediately as a, as a, as a, as a digital protectionism, because sometimes actually uh, collecting data, creating shared data spaces, for example, can be beneficial. Yeah? The city of Amsterdam, where I'm based, is creating a, a, a city, a municipality shared data space where everybody can go and uh, also query this data. This is a good thing, uh, but it comes with some conditions attached. So for example, you can extract the value from the data, but don't take all the data. This would be under the trade law paradigm. This would be a restriction to the free flow, but I think it's actually a value preserving mechanism to make sure that many can use this data and can extract value from it without necessarily exporting this data. Yeah. So there are many different ways to think about it. And I believe we should uh, renew the efforts that have started with multi-stakeholder governance, but actually focus on data as a resource, but also connect the resource, the economic properties of data with its value for societies. This is very important in the long run. If we only treat it as an economic asset, we will actually uh, damage in the long run our democracies and also our societies in the base of it. All right, that's not very optimistic. <laughs> Lee, did you want to add anything? Yeah, well, if you're if you're ready to go to questions, I have, there's a couple of the I've looked at them all, and there's a couple that I have some comments that I could make. I think a number of others might be uh, better for Christina, but I'm in your hands. All right, well, let's get started with our questions, and thank you, and we welcome more. So, um, uh, well. Uh, we are not going to name the questioners as, as a courtesy. Okay. Um, should the WTO modify its approach to data governance given the women's data breach? Anyone? I guess we have no one who wants to answer that question. Well, so, I, well, think, well, I think a short answer is no, but uh, beside, aside from that, I, I don't really have a lot to say about it. Um, um, I, the next couple of questions I think are very interesting to me. Okay. Anybody else want to answer the questions about Solar Bridge and the WTO? Okay. Um, is it better to develop concentric circles slash levels of commitments by JSI members on the rules portion of the agreement or do you think that it's possible that countries will drop? So that, that one seems to be one for you, Lee. Yeah, and actually that's interesting to me because uh, both within the Secretariat and with various of the participating members, we've been doing a lot of thinking and uh, clearly there's a concern that, that the highest ambition could, could only garner fewer members. But I, I'm extremely impressed that as of December, we had another country joined, we now have 87 participants. That's more than we get in a typical council meeting. And, you know, I think the number of participants is, is we had the, the basic telecom negotiations were considered hugely successful and we had 59 members at the end. So there's a huge number of members participating. Some of the developing countries are very, very positive. Some are positive, but want to wait and see what's in it for them. Um, I can imagine a variety of things you might mean by concentric circles and levels of commitments, but I, I think one of the 
extenuating circumstances here is whether all of the circles have um, most favored nation or non-discrimination applied to them. That's very political, I'll leave that aside. But assuming that they do, I think you saw in RCEP, for example, something that was done in WTO before, where there are footnotes to some of the rules indicating that developing country members have, say, five years uh, in which they have can get their regime in place to live up to certain of the commitments. That's certainly one of the kinds of things, you know, that the WTO can do that if, if the JSI members choose to make that kind of thing possible for some of the countries who feel they're, they're not ready. They can sign on to something ambitious and then be given a grace period. Um, also, we have other agreements like the, the trade facilitation agreement who, that has that. But it, it, the, the rules, I think, are something that people are fairly positive about. It's more of a question of how are we going to get there for some of the people who feel their capacity is less. But I am surprised that the number of African countries, for example, who, had, who have joined and who really make very positive statements in our meetings. And it's not that they're anti-e-commerce, they're not even anti, uh, you know, uh, uh, the kinds of rules we're looking at. Uh, they're hoping that there will be some additional provisions that uh, help them out and are in their interest. And that has something else I think will be discussed soon. Um, th there was another question about, um, complex and poorly understood issues. And as somebody who works so closely with IT people sometimes, excuse me, Darren, I can talk to trade people about some of these things and, and want to pull my hair out. Um, but I think that we're seeing more and more huge delegations uh, we, when it was physical. And I think it's now even more possible that, we, that the JSI has virtual meetings where governments are involving their experts from different ministries. They're involving some of the people I know, for example, from the ICT ministries, they're involving people from um, you know, postal ministries, uh, things like that. They're all bringing experts now to the table. So I think the ignorance problem is not what it was. I would recognize two or three years ago, it, was, it might have been, been sad, but I think that's improved quite a bit. And the e-commerce trade people are showing a great willingness to work and talk with and even bring to, to the meetings experts in various fields. Thank you, Lee. Um, so here's another question. Is there any willingness in the WTO um, to recognize the need to regulate cross-border data flows for both public and private purposes. Um, and I think this is clearly something that the government of Canada has brought up. So maybe Darren, you should begin with this question. So um, do you see the question? It's, again, is there any willingness, I'm not sure that's the right terminology, but does the WTO, do the, does the current state of rules differentiate between rules for private purposes in cross-border data flows and public purposes? You know, that might be relevant when you think about disinformation and the Grand Commission. And I think you have to take a look at, you know, this is a question again on scope as well. And, you know, our practice, uh, when we look at how we tackle these issues within our bilateral uh, initiatives is we scope out government held information. You know, uh, we also take into account what we have in terms of our exceptions as well, which fits into this. This is also part of the broader discussion that Christina was alluding to in terms of trying to find balance uh, on these matters. There's clearly economic imperatives that are play, but obviously there's non-economic imperatives at play. And where do we find that balance, uh, that happy medium between the two? Part of it will depend on what uh, kind of direction or approach you take in terms of your domestic regime. And, you know, Canada's approach, for instance, on some of these issues is different from, for instance, what you'd see uh, in Europe or what you would see in some other jurisdictions. Um, and, you know, that's going to be part of our, I think, uh, discussion. Um, it happens, it's going to happen both in the context of our WTO work here, and it's also going to be a continuation of our bilateral engagement with some of these uh, partners as well. And it also speaks to, I think, one of the broader challenges that are at play, and that is that all of us, or many of us anyways, um, are trying to fly the airplane as we build it or add to it as well. 
you know, we're a lot of us are undergoing domestic, uh, a re-examination of our domestic regimes. Uh, Canada's doing that right now. Uh, that impacts uh, uh, our, uh, our 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 domestic framework. And uh, that's, that's going to be a challenge, but we have no choice either. We don't have the luxury of sitting back and hoping that, you know, all this stuff will resolve and then we can get back to the negotiating table with our international trading partners. We are stuck with a situation whereby we're going to have to walk and, and chew gum at the same time and, and do our best as negotiators to ensure that, you know, we can create um, certain predictability on one hand uh, for our, our industry so that we can continue to see the grow, economic growth and prosperity uh, and the engagement of our small and medium-sized enterprises in this space. At the same time, uh, ensuring that our citizens uh, are satisfied with the results of the achievement in this regard and doesn't uh, diminish or, or uh, underscore their interests uh, in terms of how, the, how uh, privacy and personal information is addressed uh, within our domestic context and the interrelationship that has with our international trading partners. So easy peasy, and uh, we'll see what we do <laughs> moving forward. Thank you for that. Um, uh, here's a question um, that um, I think might be good for Rachel to answer as a trade lawyer. Um, it's, it's, it's the last question we have and it says, how should we treat data in economic terms at all? Should we treat data as things to which entities have property rights or as intangible goods protected by intellectual property rights? Doesn't that relate to the type of data, Rachel, do you want to take that on? I can try. Um, I'll just note broadly that as I think it's been mentioned previously, there's been a lot of work in trying to, academics trying to break down how we treat data um, in the abstract. And so I think that that's a very important discussion outside of how we treat um, data in trade agreements. I think it, data can, I mean, data is everything and nothing <laughs> at the same time. So when we think about things of attributing IP rights, um, I think there are some concerns around that. Um, I think it's better to keep uh, a sense of what type of services and what type of, um, uh, what is being traded um, in mind when we're trying to craft rules here. Um, so I don't think that there are clear ways that we can um, uh, try to borrow from the IP space, but um, I would turn it over to others who might have other thoughts. Yeah, this is such an interesting question, he or she. Uh, we framed it at the end. How can we effectively regulate something what we do, that we do not agree to take that on? Suzanne? Do you want to take that on? Uh, I'm still thinking about uh, what is data. <laughs> you know, it's a wonderful uh, question, actually, because uh, it throws us back to a better understanding what we are trying to regulate. And that is always a good idea to start with. Uh, data can be almost anything because we are living now, we are undergoing a digital transformation and, and large chunks of our, uh, yeah, of our daily doings of our economy, but also of our societal interactions of our institutions are now residing in the digital space. Data can be the architecture of a software. Data can be uh, the music that we consume via streaming. Data can be almost anything. In a way, uh, data, I sometimes tell my students, uh, is like the carbon uh, atom yeah, that, uh, from which all life is built. So it can be a tree. It can be uh, a human. It can be something like my table here. So data, uh, trying to find just one common like frame for data may actually do not justice to data's uh, wealth and variety and to the very many different properties data have. So I still want to say, yes, digital um, services should be tradable across borders. Also products that have digital components should be tradable across services, but the free flow of data is a concept that is, has no normative underpinnings and is way too broad. Would anyone else like to take that on? Just to, if I could just quickly add on just um, what we're seeing on the, the national level. Um, 
there still is not a clear understanding of or common common definition of a lot of these key categories. So when we're looking at how do you regulate certain types of data, there's very different interpretations of critical personal data or what personal data is. And so that type of uncertainty that one could, could be unclear in national laws, um, but could also um, be used in different contexts, that type of um, lack of consensus makes it very difficult for um, industry um, to be able to operate on a global basis. And so having some kind of consistency in terms of what data we're talking about that's subject to certain regulations is helpful. I lost you there, Rachel. I don't know what you just said. It's okay, I can add something. Okay. Just, just briefly, I, I know I've, I've sat down and made little tables for myself of when I hear data being talked about and data flows being talked about, I get the sense that some people are talking about different things than other people, not because there is no definition, but because everyone has their perspective. If I'm talking to people from ICANN or ISOC, they're thinking about the, 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 the system, the networks that make data flow when they talk about uh, data flows. And uh, then you have people who are talking uh, very much about the flows of the, the, the business intracorporate communications. And then you have people are talking about the actual trade that's going on that is represents a data flow. And I think that depending, and so I don't think it's not defined. I think people are clearly talking about some different levels here and there may be different solutions for those different levels. So that does make it simple, that difficult, that, that people use the same term for what in their heads may be some very different things. And, and if I can just also add, I think we have to accept the fact that uh, as sovereign nations, we're gonna regulate in this space differently from one another. There's not gonna be a common approach on all these issues. Uh, and, and certainly there's uh, huge challenges in terms of just how we define or go about some of these issues ourselves. So as long as we understand that, that you know, our approach will be different, but at the same time, it still achieves a general same objective that maybe is in place in another jurisdiction, that's our space we can work from. If we, on top of that, we add on strong transparency provisions so that uh, uh, industry operators know exactly what is happening in various jurisdictions, it's not an opaque situation, and that we don't introduce uh, falsely um, uh, trade distorting uh, types of actions that are clearly intended to discriminate against uh, foreign suppliers. You know, this is the kind of discussion I think we can have, but it does come down to though, uh, I think as basic tenant, a recognition that uh, we are gonna have different approaches in place. It's just so long as that we meet certain um, expectations in that regard and doesn't necessarily have unintended consequences. Uh, there needs to be, you know, uh, you know, I think that that needs to be part of our, our understanding. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that contribution. It leads into the next question, which is, you know, given longstanding historical and cultural differences on governance, especially with regard to privacy, national security, are we going to inevitably see a split into data realms due to the profound differences in these domestic regulations? So does that mean the WTO will be the lowest common denominator? We've already seen this happen with RCEP where you know, the initial news was China signed on to the free flow of data when in fact, if you actually read the agreement, does anyone wanna comment on this question again? Is it, will we see a split in data, into data realms due to the profound differences? Who wants to take that on? I could make a couple of comments, but I would Please. then defer to Darren. I mean. I don't think you're going to get a lowest common denominator because you won't get an agreement if you get a lowest common denominator. It won't happen. I think uh, I think a lot of people, and not just industrialized countries, are looking for a high standard uh, of an agreement. But uh, that, that what what Darren said was extremely important. That we make principles at the WTO, and then various domestic regimes that function with various approaches have to bring them into consistency with some very basic trade principles. Um, the difficulty is not to bring a regime into consistency with trade principles like transparency, non-discrimination and so on. The difficulty for many countries is 
there's a Chinese model, there's a European model, um, you know, there's not much else out there. How do we do this? And I see that people like UNCTAD and, and, and the International Trade Commission are providing a huge amount of technical assistance to governments on drafting legislation and, 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 and regulatory frameworks. So there, is, there are people out there who are probably more expert than us on some of the specifics of certain kinds of legal frameworks uh, that might be in place that, that are working with governments to help them figure out because there's perhaps not a clear sense of what's best practice. This is another reason why WTO principles can basically allow for regulatory innovation in a space where I think best practice is, is emerging. Can I take you on on that? <laughs> Just to say that I don't think anybody knows what best practice is. That's, I mean, yes, I mean, that's Ascertain what I'm saying. That in a, I mean, that is the purpose of my work with Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you ascertain that? Nobody knows. And what may be right for, you know, um, Somalia may not be right for Canada. Does anyone else want to answer this question? Okay, um, here's a question directly for Christina. Building on Christina's comments on data exchanges, as sector industry driven data collaboratives, data trusts come online, how do you envision them interfacing with multilateral rule making? I uh, understand it in one particular way. Uh, in a trade law context, it would, uh, if this is a mandatory a uh, creature of, of, of a public authority or of a municipality, then uh, you would quickly end up uh, looking whether this has, is, is violating a trade law commitment. Uh, for example, because it, uh, it, uh, it compiles data, uh, but does not necessarily, uh, not everyone has, for example, the same access to it, or it, it locates data on a certain territory and only you can only query the data uh, uh, via an interface. Uh, such uh, solutions are possible from a data value point of view. This is actually a totally fair solution. You can still access the data. You can create value from it. You just cannot transport the, uh, the data itself. It is uh, from a trade law point of view, it would be considered protectionist. From a data governance point of view, it's actually fully legitimate practice. So uh, there are some tensions already uh, emerging with what we are right now starting to experiment. Uh, in the European Union, we want to create European data spaces. This would be one of these things, you know, a European data space for health, for open uh, research data. There, there would be several, several of these data spaces and they are designed to create uh, <coughs> uh, the necessary uh, scale and scope of data and the necessary to collect them, to, to uh, curate this data, to, to make it possible to actually have one place to go to find all these different data already in a place and then create value with it. This is a good idea. This is progressive because the only place that you have at the moment to find such a wealth of data are the large digital tech platforms and they are usually not sharing. Uh, Susan, I have a quick comment. Please. Um, you know, I wasn't reading the question. I mean, I guess, uh, uh, Christina, you may be assuming that these kind of ideas naturally imply data localization requirements will be in place. And, and I, I've talked to people at IGF and, and, and been to uh, seminars and met experts, and I'm not sure they necessarily apply, imply data localization. I think they can be done on a cloud and it doesn't really matter where they are. If they choose to do them at home, there's nothing wrong with that. A data localization requirement would, would, would be a problem even if JSI didn't get anywhere because we've looked at this in potential inconsistencies with GATS. But I talk to people about things like data trust and, 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 and data sharing that I don't necessarily feel it has to be combined with, with with um, data localization uh, restrictions. So I guess it could be, but it could be done other ways. Okay, thank you, Lee. Does anyone else wanna say anything? Cause we're gonna wrap it up now. 
we're losing people. Okay, so let me just say thank you, Patrick, who could not be here for um, his work in this area. Thank you to all of our speakers for taking so much of their time to work with me on this webinar. This is our last webinar of the year. I want to thank my colleagues, Thomas and Ian, for their hard work in inviting people and organizing these webinars. And I also want to thank our partners in these webinars. Um, so I really appreciate your attendance and your thoughtful questions. And we're going to try to figure out ways to make these more interactive. Our next webinar will be in January, and it's going to focus on collective data rights. And I'm really excited about that. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically saying that privacy is not just about individuals, but because of how firms use data analytics, it is also about group privacy because data analytics groups us into various groups and firms use those groups to make decisions about access to education, credit, credit criminal sentencing, et cetera. And this is something we should all learn a little bit more about. Oh, I shouldn't tell everybody what they should learn about, in my opinion. Anyway, I wish everybody a fabulous holiday. Thank you so much for joining with us. And let me also remind you that if you are interested in training on data-driven issues, please get in touch with us. Thank you so much, everybody. Happy holidays. Bye.